see it if you would. I'm going to ask Tim if he'll come up. Tim, Head, if you'll step up here and help me move the pulpit this morning. Tim Markham, you can help as well if you don't mind. I'm going to grab all of it. We'll make a little change here this morning. Let me grab my water here. I'm going to get that off. All right. Turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis, if you would, to the book of Genesis, if you would. Um, now, you don't see this often from me, but I'm going to uh, do a little... We're going to sit around. We're going to talk a little bit this morning. Um, for the next week or two, uh, we're still in the series on the family, talking about the family. Very important for us to do, and it applies to everybody. Everybody's a part of a family of some sort. Amen? Amen. Boy, I tell you, she's right. We got a rough crowd this morning. <laughs> Come on now, y'all. Got don't leave me hanging up here. I think we're all a part of some sort of family. Amen. Amen. Good to have you back. Welcome to Shirley Baptist Church. I am glad you have come today. All right. Uh, chapter thirty-seven in your Bibles. Normal message is about four pages. I have seven. Settle in. Amen. It's gonna be a while. Uh, uh, Nah, I'm somewhat kidding. <laughs> I, do have, I do have seven pages of notes. I think it'll go very quickly or as quick as possible. So uh, uh, if not, uh, I'll apologize ahead of time. We're going to have a good morning today. We're going to talk about a story that you're very, very familiar with. I'm certain of it. Uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, we'll be speaking about Joseph. We know Joseph for the coat of many colors, but we're going to speak more on his life today and the messages that come from his life. And there are so many, but we'll just be speaking of a few of them today. But we've been focused on the family now for a couple of weeks. Uh, so hopefully you've enjoyed our, our time and, uh, and a little bit more laid back, but, uh, and we'll have a couple more weeks. So if you've enjoyed the time, then you have this week and next week to look forward to. If you've not enjoyed it, you only have one more week to bear it, all right? So it's almost through. So uh, uh, we're getting there. But I've enjoyed it. The, the family is a very foundational fighting unit. Uh, against Satan. We train in the home. Our home should be a training point. We are training uh, us to, to come and uh, our children to come along beside us to be a part of this fight against Satan, against evil, uh, in our nation, in our churches, uh, certainly in our communities. So what we have here, the story in Genesis chapter 37, let me get over there. Now I'm going to be hopping through the book of Genesis this morning. Uh, verse 14. So I'm going back and forth. I have all up on the screen just in case because of this. It's you know uh, sometimes hard to get back and forth. So they'll be each up on the screen, but I'm going to read it from the Word. And he said unto them, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with, my, with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, to, and, to he came for, and he came to Shechem. Now, this is uh, Jacob, the father, sending out Joseph. And we know the story. He's going to check on his brothers. And, and the brothers aren't where they're supposed to be, but he figures out just a little bit earlier where they are. Somebody gives him a word, so he's going that direction. So as he's coming, his brothers see him. and He's this young, younger brother. He's daddy's favorite. Uh, so when they see him coming... They say, let's just kill him. Nothing like a little brotherly love. Amen. <laughs> let's take care of this right now. Let's we'll just kill him. And, and then the voice of reason or this great uh, cloud of mercy comes upon them. And they say, now let's just throw him in the well. All right. So we just throw him in the well. So they throw him in. He's there for a while. And they decide, you know what? We can profit from this. So let's just sell him into slavery. Boy, with brothers like this, no need of enemies. Amen. So, uh, so they're going to sell him into slavery. That's what they do. They sell him into slavery. They get a little bit of coin. Remember, they rip his clothes. They tear his clothes. They go back to their parents. Boy, this is some real brothers. And they break their parents' heart. And they say, Joseph has been killed. And they've torn his clothes, put some animal blood on them, and he's gone. We don't know where he is. So now Joseph is in slavery. Joseph, they are pretty well off. Jacob has done very, very well. And so they have many slaves. And Joseph knows what it's like to be a slave. And he knows that the life he has known all of his life is now over. And there's a brand new life that is going to begin. And he's now a slave 
think about this, put yourself into his shoes, and I try to do this. He is on the south end of a northbound camel. Hands tied walking behind him. It isn't a pretty picture, and there he goes. And for how long, we don't know how, how it was. Was it chained? Was he roped? How did this go? We don't have any idea. But I can promise you it was not pretty. It is not what we look at as prison today. They didn't have, he didn't go there where he had closed circuit TV and internet access and, and weight rooms and all of this stuff. Listen, folks, we're not rehabilitating anyone. We're, we, are, we are saying it's all right. Come here to the, to the, you know, to the castle and, and we'll just teach you how to be better criminals. That's what we're doing. Uh, we could do a whole lot better. I think we go back to making little rocks out of big rocks. Uh, and uh, so uh, we'll do a whole lot better, but that's just my spiel on this. We'll, we'll move forward. All right, so Joseph is uh, now uh, as a slave, and he goes into slavery, and uh, he's, but he continues, this is the thing, he, he continues to serve God. He continues to worship God. He continues to believe in God. And if you're honest, there's a lot of people who look at it and say, why in the world would you continue to do this when your God that you pray to, worship, and, and believe in has now allowed you to become a slave? Well, Joseph is blessed, and he goes into the house of Potiphar, and Potiphar is very wealthy himself, and um, he becomes head of the house as far as slaves go. All right? Now he's in charge of pretty much everything except for Potiphar's wife, and and certain enough, you know, Potiphar's wife wants Joseph to kind of become her, her boy toy, and, and Joseph says, uh, probably could have come up with a better. <laughs> I didn't know how else to say it. I, I mean, there's other ways, but I was trying to be, you know, somewhat politically correct. I'm not sure. But you all got the picture, so. So, uh, and sure enough, something happens and, and uh, she uh, is, uh, becomes very affectionate toward Joseph and Joseph runs, alright? Uh, we need to teach our teenagers this, if at any point uh, a boy tries to get a little too fresh, just start screaming and run. <laughs> You'll get plenty of attention, young ladies. Uh, and the same way thing goes for our young boys. But So, he runs away and she accuses him of rape and certainly they're going to believe Potiphar's wife over Joseph back into prison he goes. So now Joseph is back into prison and, and so, but he says, and let's think about this, when he was talking, when Potiphar's wife was making her advances, she said, I, or Joseph said, I, I'm not going that direction out of respect for your husband he was trying to remind her that she was married and for, out of respect for my God. So here's Joseph who's now been sold, thrown into a well, sold into slavery, works his way out of slavery. Now he's, he's accused of rape and he's back in prison. But yet he continues to believe in God. So he's continuing on to believe that all of this, there must be a greater purpose, a bigger purpose. And each one of us comes to a point in life where quit looks good. And I can promise you Joseph is at this point where he's sitting here going, why? And you may have actually asked yourself this question and said, why do I continue serving the Lord when it's so hard? It would be so much easier for me to just, I'm saved, I'm good, I'm just going to quit, I'm going to live a good life, but I'm not going to get myself on the front lines, I'm just going to kind of hang back and relax. I've got my fire insurance. I'm going to just squeak my way into heaven. <coughs> and there's no doubt you have these, these thoughts that go through your mind and we go into self-preservation mode, but that's not the answer. So the story continues, and certainly he's, uh, she makes the, that accusation. He's thrown into prison. Now, Genesis chapter 39, verse 21, if you'll put there with me. Chapter 39, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison or the prison warden. Well, listen, I venture to say that there was probably nobody here in the house of the Lord this morning that became a Christian with high hopes of gaining favor with the prison warden. 
Now some of you is looking over the crowd probably became a Christian in hopes of not going to prison. <laughs> Or maybe some of you here said, I have high hopes of, of having favor with the judge, but I guarantee nobody here got saved and said, oh, dog, I'm a Christian. Can't wait to go to jail. <laughs> he had gained favor inside of a prison warden. So this is probably not the way we would write this story up, but this is God. His ways are not our ways, and His ways are so far beyond our ways. He had gained favor. In this time period of gaining favor, there was a couple of gentlemen who joined him in the prison. So as he gains favor with the prison warden, he is actually put in charge of the entire prison, of all of the slaves. So as he's there, grab a hold of this, come to visit is Pharaoh's baker and his butler. Now, this, this does not pay. This is rough business, all right? You disappoint. Listen, if your pineapple upside down cake isn't to par, you're in prison. <laughs> this ain't joking around, all right? So if you don't clean exactly right, you're in prison. So now the baker and, and, and the butler come to prison and Joseph's in charge and they have this dream and they cannot figure this dream out and they know that this is important. Joseph hears their dream and he says, I got this. My God has this. He said, this is very simple. You In three days, you both will be exonerated. You will leave the jail. But I'm sorry to say, one of you will be all right and you'll be back into the graces of Pharaoh. The other will be hung. Whew. Listen, if you're the one guy, you're celebrating. Hot dog. If you're the, if you're the other guy, if you're the baker, the baker died for the bad pineapple upside down cake. So he was hung. The butler was good. He's back in the graces of his Lord. Of, the, of, of that time, they thought of Pharaoh as God. Pharaoh demanded to be treated as God. So the baker's dead. The butler's back in his presence. Before they left the jail, um, Joseph said this, Please remember me. If you do me any favor, remember me when you get out of here because I've been thrown in here. It's unjust. I don't deserve to be here. You can tell by my accent, I'm, I'm not from here. <laughs> this isn't my place. Please remember me. They get out, the one dies, the other gains favor, forgets all about him. Man, Joseph can't catch a break. So two years later, two years later, Genesis chapter 41, verse 15 and 16. So now, we have... He's still in slavery. He's still in the prison. He's in charge. He's getting favor with the warden. Woohoo! I know. But he's still in jail. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard uh, say of thee that thou can understand a dream to interpret it. Verse 16, and Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh the answer to peace. Now that sounds like, you know what? That's a good job. He did well. But you know what he just done? He just slapped Pharaoh in the face. Pharaoh said, I hear you can interpret dreams. And he says, I cannot. But my God will. Pharaoh demanded to be treated as God. And in retrospect, he lived as God. He felt like he was God. And Joseph just told him, in his house, my God is greater than you are. And as they, the guards began to unsheath the swords to slice him up into little pieces to go to the new baker, <laughs> Pharaoh said, no, no, hang tight. Keep your swords in the sheath. I've got to hear, the, I've got to hear this dream. Because... I don't know what's going on. So Pharaoh tells Joseph about the dream. Joseph says, my God has this. Do you want to hear it? He says, absolutely, I want to hear this. So as they continue on, Joseph says, this is what your dream says. In seven, you're going to have seven years of absolute just abundance. So over the next seven years, Pharaoh, what you need to do is bank everything you can. Build more silos, stack in the grain, 
And you need to tax 20%. Everybody under your command to bring in that grain. Put in your silos. Because for the next seven years, you're going to stack them full. Because after that seven years, we're going to go into a famine. And when this famine happens, you will be the only one that has grain. And when the people run out of grain, they're going to come to you. And you're going to have such a stash in this seven years of abundance that they are going to come to you and you are going to charge them a mint and you are going to be richer than Donald Trump. <laughs> I don't think Trump was around then. It may be less. At least his hairdo probably was. <laughs> Sorry, I said that. I, that was free. I'm not charging for So, he's got to go in and Pharaoh says... This is a fantastic idea. Is there anybody in the kingdom that can come up with a better idea? Do you, and he looks to his wise men of the day and he says, Is this not a great idea? I'm like, yes, this is a great idea. But we need somebody to move the plan forward. Pharaoh looks to Joseph and he says, What are you doing for the next 14 years? I got a plan. Joseph, wide eyed, all of a sudden he goes from prison to prime minister. He says, you're the man. Everybody around him says, what? And I'm certain it was in a very high-pitched voice just like that. What? And he says, yep, you're in charge. Prison to prime minister, here he is. Number two in the entire world. This was the largest. They were in charge. So now he's out. He's in charge. Now, what happens after this? We all know what happens. Certainly, seven years of absolute abundance. Seven years of famine begins. Two years into that famine, about 20 years after his brothers had thrown him into the well, what happens? The family of Jacob, his father, their family, his brothers, <coughs> who through great mercy decided not to kill him, but to sell him into slavery, show up, at his feet, they don't recognize him because when they brought him up out of prison, they shaved him. He looked like an Egyptian. He walked like an Egyptian and talked like an Egyptian. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> and all of you are sitting here doing this, shame, shame, shame. So, they didn't recognize him. He comes out, whoo, I know, here he is. He's got him. They don't know. So he... This is funny because Ellie's sitting up here going, What's he talking about? <laughs> and all the kids are going, What's he talking about? Don't look it up on, don't Google it or nothing like that. Just take my word for it. It was a bad period in all of our lives. All right. <laughs> so, we're, we're not, no longer walking and talking like Egyptians, but we're moving on. And so here we are. And, um, oh, we're doing great on time. So here we are. Here he is. His brothers are in front of him. They have nothing to eat. They have nothing going on. And they do not recognize Joseph. Now we're going to connect some dots. What would you do? I want to ask you, if you're in Joseph, Joseph, Joseph's position, what do you do? Whew. Run them through a grinder? Ship them up like bark? We're all sitting here thinking. You think about that for a minute. What do you do? But we're going to connect some dots because his decision probably throws all of us off. But his decision was probably influenced by a decision in his family much, much earlier in his life. Go back to Genesis 25. So in your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter 25, verse 29. Now, same family. And we have uh, Abraham, Isaac, and then certainly of, of Isaac, we have uh, Jacob and Esau. Joseph was of the family of Jacob, so this is earlier. This is way before Joseph. This is Jacob and Esau's day. So, uh, chapter, verse 29, And Jacob saw the pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. So now, 
This is the father, the family that Joseph is from. He's in his young days. He's about a teenager here. Esau and Jacob were as opposite as opposite gets. Extremely opposite. Esau was the manly man. He was dad's favorite. Esau was the hunter-gatherer. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Jacob was mama's boy. And he knew how to cook. Today, I love to cook. In this day and time, you know, they're treating him like a stepchild. Esau's the, he's the man. And he's a hairy dude. <laughs> and you, do you remember, you know the story? They're going back. What's getting ready to happen? Esau has been out hunting. And he's been out for a while because he comes in and literally, I believe the man is on the, on the verge of starving. He comes in from out hunting and he smells this stew that Jacob has now made. And Esau is just, you know, he's a teenager. You know, no connection from the frontal lobe to all everything else. There's no reasoning. You're living in the moment. Sorry, teenagers, I love you, but it is what it is. All right, you can't see by, by the side of tomorrow, today. Can't see beyond that. All right, we don't make rational decisions as teenagers. Many of us well into our 20s. Some into your 30s and some never. It's just reality, all right? Never connects. I'm not real sure what happened. You got dropped as a child, not real sure, but there's some people who just cannot make rational decisions to see beyond the day, all right? That just happened. So here's one of them. Esau says, man, am I hungry. I can't believe this smells so good. Esau being the oldest brother, you know, you never get as a younger brother the opportunity to take advantage of the older brother. And especially, this is daddy's guy. He's the hairy hunter dude. And, and he's the manly man. And Jacob, he says, I want some of that, that stew. And Jacob says, it's going to cost you. Esau says, all right, fine. How much? He says, it's going to cost you your birthright. Today, that would mean you will get two to three times the inheritance than everybody else. You will be in charge of the family when I die. And over a bowl of stew, Esau says, deal. Can you believe that? Listen, I like to eat. As much as anybody. But I'm thinking, man, what was you thinking? What's going on? So he takes the birthright. He's not ex exactly happy at all. Well, Isaac, the, the father of Jacob and Esau, he gets very sick. So now Isaac is sick. And he's coming in. He's bringing the boys in. He's going to give the blessing to the oldest boy. The blessing is you're in charge. You're going, your inheritance will be greater than all other inheritance. You're going to be the man. Rebecca hears of this. Remember, Jacob's the mama's boy. So Rebecca goes and says, Jacob, we've got to hurry up and do something. Because if we don't, your brother Esau is still going to get the burnt her. He's still going to get the blessing from your father. And he's going to be in charge. You, we've got to do something. So they take some animal hide and they put it on his arm. And they sent... I'm telling you, I, we can't believe this today, but he was, I mean, he was a hairy dude. And he takes us, you go in and you get the blessing. You trick your father. So he goes in, gets the blessing. The father, if you remember, Isaac says, you don't sound like Esau. But you, he reaches up and he touches his, his arm and he says, but you feel like Esau. And he gives Jacob the blessing. So now Jacob has the inheritance, he has the blessing, he's going to be in charge. Esau comes in, hears of this, blows a gasket. Esau is not a happy camper. Is this the one I'm on? Yes. Genesis 27, 41. So Esau gets upset and he hated his Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand that I will slay my brother. Esau says, When the moment my father dies, I am going to bury my brother right with him. And he will go into the afterlife with my father. And he was upset. And he was mad. 
at what had been done. So he says, all right, Mama, again, she's protecting her baby. She said, Jacob, we got to get you out of here. Go to Isaac before he dies. They tell him a story. They get, they get uh, uh, Jacob to get out of town before Esau can get a hold of him. Jacob goes to spend his days with his mom's brother or his uncle on his mom's side. They figure he'll be safe if we can get him away from all of Isaac's people. Hang on. I've got one point. At the end, and it won't make any sense if I lose you. So just give me a few more minutes. We're almost there. I'm going to tie the two together and hopefully, hopefully connect some dots that maybe you've never put back together. So now, he goes off and he's away and he is in hiding and he gets married and he begins to have children and about 20 years goes by. 20 years passes by. He has two wives, a couple concubines, 11 children and more goats than sheep that can actually graze in the land. His uncle says, you have to leave. You've become so wealthy. You are eating all of my livestock's food. I can't afford for you to stay. He says, where am I going to go? And the Lord said unto Jacob in, in chapter 31, 3, return to the land of your fathers. Whew. That wouldn't be a bad idea if the land of your fathers didn't include who? Esau. You are listening. He says, go back to the land where your brother, whose birthright and money you stole, that's where I want you to go. And I'm certain Jacob said, Lord, you had better be with me or I'm a dead man. I won't make it through this. And neither will my wives, my girlfriends. It's a different time, different era. <laughs> Nobody gets to go home and start planning through the future and more wives and more girlfriends. All right, it's, it's not a different time. He says, they'll kill them, all of my children, and he'll take all my wealth because when I roll into town, Esau will look at our great wealth and he will, it'll be more than he can handle and he'll say, I'm going to get my birthright back from my brother. And he passed over before them. Now, Verse 2 says this. i got to get there with you. Sorry. Alright. And he put his handmaids and children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph. You grab this? Joseph in the back. So now, he's going home. He gets near home. Esau hears of his coming. Esau and 400 men whew, came out. It didn't say 400 family members. It was not his wife and children coming to say hello to the lost, long lost uncle and all of their family. 400 men. Esau had a small army going out to meet his brother Jacob. So Jacob says, well, it's a good opportunity or a good chance. We're all going to die here, so let's at least give them, you know, give ourselves a chance. I'm going to stagger them out. So he takes his two girlfriends and their children and he puts them in the front. <laughs> Better hope he was liked in this day and time. So he puts them in front. After them comes his second favorite wife. And after and her children, and after the second favorite wife comes his, his favorite wife. And Joseph, in the back, the one who in just a little while will make a huge decision. And he goes out before them. And he walks out in front of them. And between the very first, the most least liked of the girlfriends, and until he gets to Esau, he stops seven times. Please, Lord, don't let him kill him. Please, Lord, don't let him kill me and my wives. Please, Lord, don't let him kill me and my wife and my children. 
Well, please, Lord, don't let him kill my wife, wives, girlfriends, and children. And he's praying the whole way out. Seven times he stops and he says whatever he says. And when he gets to Esau, you know the story? If you don't, you need to read it. It's a great story. It's great. He says, all right. Esau runs out to him, hangs upon his neck. Embraced him, fell on his neck, kissed him, and they wept together. Esau showed mercy to Joseph. And he set an example for Joseph. I have no idea where my notes where I'm at. Oh. He chose mercy over vengeance. He had an opportunity right there to get back all of his money, his birthright, to gain all of this wealth in which Joseph was now, or in which Jacob was now bringing to the very forefront and get all of this stuff that he could have got. And he could have got revenge upon his brother, his lying brother, but he spared the lives of Jacob. And he spared the lives of Jacob's family. And he spared the life of Joseph. And Joseph saw it. And all of his life, he had heard this story. And they had told their children and their children's children about the time when Uncle Esau spared Jacob's life. And here's Joseph. And he's now standing as the number two man years later. And his brothers, his deceiving Conniving, lying brothers are knelt before him. And life and death is in his hands. And at the very turn of a finger or wrist, he can kill them and gain vengeance. But he, all of his life, had heard a story about Uncle Esau. And the time he showed mercy to Jacob. Say, Pastor, that's a great story. First off, it's God's story. But how does this apply to the family? What your children do, mom and dad, Grandma, Grandpa, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whatever the case may be, will be a direct reflection of what they see in you do. It'll be a direct reflection of, this, of the decisions you make. All of Joseph's life, he had heard the story of Uncle Esau. And mercy. And in that moment of great strength, he showed mercy. What if your decisions, your actions, the things you do or don't do in pressure, stress, trials, all of these instances, what if your decisions impact the lives of your children? What if your actions in tough times are a direct reflection of how your children will act? Because this is what I can promise you, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whoever you are here today. They will react as you have acted. They are watching you. They may not listen to you. <laughs> let, me, let me go a step farther. They won't listen to you. <laughs> they will forget everything you have said, probably. But the moment things get tight and mom and dad doesn't pay a bill, the moment 
Things get tight. And dad turns to the bottle and not the Bible. The moment things get rough and mom turns to another relationship instead of a relationship with Jesus Christ, they will remember that. They will remember how you acted and how you responded in stress-filled situations. And this, I promise, they will duplicate your reactions. I wish we could sit here and say, well, maybe they will learn from my bad decisions. Nine times out of ten, that does not happen. What I, what I see day in, day out, week in, week out, is children making the same mistakes they saw their parents make. Say, preacher, that's a lot of pressure. It is. It's a lot of responsibility. And we need to take our actions as parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, and sisters serious. Because our children are watching. Joseph. No doubt made a decision based upon Uncle Esau and the mercy that was shown to him. We all have, you know, the saying goes, you can pick your friends, but you cannot pick your family. You're stuck with them. And we have a side, I have a side to my family that I dearly love. My grandmother was a woman. I've met two grandparents in my day that love just absolutely flowed from. And it was given to anybody and everybody to walk through the door. And my grandma was one of them. Whoever, didn't matter who it was, walked through that door, her name was Grandma. All of us, cousins, everybody. And she loved everybody. But her whole family, I grew up with them and I watched them. <coughs> and they were drunks. And they fought. And it was a terrible way to grow up. And I would have thought, and we want to think, they're going to learn from this. They're not going to repeat this. And I grew up with a generation of more drunks. More drug addicts. And I watched their children become drunks and drug addicts. Why? Because they were just doing what they see mom and dad do. What they seen their uncles and aunts do. Church, I love you. And I love your families. But we must understand the gravity of the situation we're in. Your decision will not just impact you, but they will impact children to come. You can hear a pin drop. <laughs> this is not easy. Because you don't know why. So over the last week, I've had to face the things that I've made sound okay for my children. I had to face the things they saw in their father as a young man that they should not have seen. And there's nobody here that will be perfect. But we need to understand how important it is for our children to see us to have mercy above vengeance. To act in love and in grace. And take responsibility as parents to say, I want to not only tell my children how to be a Christian, but I want to show them. And I want their actions for Christ to be because they saw me set the example. 
and family, this nation and this world will fall apart. As the family goes, so will this world go. It's important for us to understand your role in life, where we are at, and what's happening around us. Let's pray.